Hello and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and this lecture, this video is on Henry IV Part 1 by Shakespeare and it's called Kings and Coins and it's part one of my Kings and Coins presentation. And what I'll be doing is talking in this, uh, in these presentations about economic language in Henry IV Part 1 and how that economic language relates to the political issues, the political themes in the play. Now to get where we're eventually going to go, we have to take a sort of meandering route. And so I'm going to start in perhaps a somewhat unexpected place, and that's an economic question, a very basic economic question, the question of value. Where does value come from? How do you know what something is worth? If you're a seller, how do you know how much to sell your product for? If you're a buyer, how do you know if you're paying a fair price? Uh, so this is a very fundamental economic question, and in order to answer it, I'm going to give you a, a really simplified version of Karl Marx's discussion of the origins of money. Um, so this is a very simplified version, and some of the other videos that I've posted on the course website will go into much more detail, but let me give you a brief overview. And to do so, we start with the commodity. So. What is the commodity? Well, for our purposes, we can think of the commodity very simply as any product of human labor that satisfies some need or use, something that humans make or uh, uh, somehow create from working on the raw materials provided by nature, made for some purpose to satisfy some human need. This is what Marx calls an object's use value. And every commodity has a distinct use value. Every commodity is used for something different. Cars are used for one thing. Shoes are used for something different. Cell phones are used for something different. So their use values are all very, uh, are all distinct from each other. So now let's look at a very simplified version of the marketplace. We've got this world of commodities. Ellen has commodity A, which are shoes that she has made. Felipe has commodity B, cell phones that he's made. Ellen wants a cell phone, Felipe wants shoes. How can they each get what they want? How does one person get the commodity of another? Well, apart from robbery, the way that we exchange, the way that we, we uh, uh, get different commodities is through the process of trade, through exchange. So, but now we have this problem. How are we gonna exchange these two very different things? In order to trade them, the different commodities need to be somehow made equivalent to one another. That's the only way that there can be an exchange of one for another. And as I noted before, the use values are totally different. So you can't compare them via use values. You can't say, well, the shoe and the cell phone, you can't compare them by what you use them for because you use them for totally different things. So that's not a useful way of comparing them for the process of exchange. So we need something we need to express these commodities in terms of their exchange value. This is a different form of value that Marx talks about. It's different from use value. Exchange value, the value that they have as commodities to be exchanged, not as objects to be used. So where does exchange value come from? Well, the simplest form uh, of exchange value is just a, a form of relative value, that is, one commodity is expressed in terms of another. X number of commodity A equals Y number of commodity B, or vice versa, Y number of commodity B equals X number of commodity A. So we have something like 10 shoes equals one cell phone, one cell phone equals 10 shoes. So now we have an equation. And by equating these two to each other in terms of their amounts, their relative value, now we can trade. Ellen can give Felipe 10 shoes, Felipe can give Ellen one cell phone, or Ellen can give Felipe 20 shoes, and Felipe can give Ellen two cell phones. A very simple mathematical relationship that allows for simple trade between two parties. Now, relative values, while they, while they may be useful uh, for this individual form of bartering between one person and another, they're very inefficient when it comes to widespread or wide, uh, large-scale trading. Because imagine if we had to do this. Every time you go to the store, you have to figure out, well, I've got so many shoes, how many cell phones is that worth? How many jackets are my shoes worth? How many cars can I buy with a thousand pairs of shoes? It would be ridiculous if you were, had to try to compute 
the value of every commodity in terms of every other commodity. It would be impossible to trade anything. It'd just be too endlessly tedious. So relative values, not useful for trade. How do we solve this problem? Well, we need something that Marx calls the money commodity. Something that is a single commodity that serves as a universal bearer of value. That is something that all other commodities can be converted to. The exchange value of all other commodities can be related to the money commodity. So it's a common unit of exchange that mediates between any two commodities, making it easy to measure the equivalence, their equivalence, how they relate to one another. So if all things relate to a single money commodity, it makes it much easier to determine what they're worth because their worth is all the, the different worths, the different values, rather than being expressed in thousands of different commodities, relative values, it's all expressed in one relative value of the money commodity itself. So when we talk about a money commodity, what, what does that mean? What kinds of things can we use? What, what serves as a money commodity? Well, we need something stable. And by that, I mean something physically stable, something that's not going to degrade, something that cannot be easily adulterated or destroyed, and also something that can be measured and controlled. If you can't, this is why you couldn't use leaves as a money commodity. They, one, they're not very stable. Leaves are very easily destroyed. Also, they are produced constantly. You can, it's hard to measure. You can't really control the, out, the production of them. So something like leaves would be pointless. Historically, precious metals have been uh, the ideal money commodity for most societies. Precious metals, in particular, in particular gold, but also silver. Why are these precious metals so useful as money commodities? Well, of course, there's a long history of them being desirable, but they're essentially permanent, right? Gold, you can store a piece of gold for decades, centuries. It's not going to degrade. It's not going to disintegrate. Um, you can very easily, or not necessarily easily, but with some technical uh, uh, assistance, measure the properties of gold. You can measure its weight. You can measure its, its uh, uh, purity. You can control the production and circulation of gold. So it's a very useful commodity to store or bear the value. All other commodities their exchange value then becomes expressed in a certain amount, a certain weight of gold. And that's what represents, that's what bears the exchange value of these commodities. However, there's a problem with the money commodity. Let's imagine if we used gold for all of our transactions. How would you purchase anything at the store? Would you have a bag full of little tiny grains of gold that you would then weigh out for your groceries? Uh, what if you drop the bag? What if someone sneezed? Do you carry around uh, different, all sorts of different weights of gold, little, little chunks of one gram, a bunch of one gram pieces, 10 gram pieces? It's just very inefficient to use the money commodity itself for trade. So we seem to have not really solved the problem of trade all that well. What's the solution? Well, the money commodity then becomes essentially money, right? Rather than the commodity itself, the amount of the commodity, the amount of gold representing the value, the object itself has a titular value, a nominal value. It bears a fixed amount of value. So for example, a dollar bill represents $1. It's not a dollar's worth of paper or a dollar's worth of gold. It represents $1. Again, historically speaking, what has been the uh, what's the first step in turning the money commodity into money? Coins. Coins are easy to transport. They are solid and stable, just like gold. They're they're metal, so they can be stored. They won't degrade. You can set the value of a coin, and at least initially in their history, coins were usually made out of the money commodity itself. So initially the coin would be a certain weight of gold. Seems like a solution, right? Now we have a much easier way to transport around our commodities, our money commodity, in these uh, easy set values that allow us to trade and exchange money for other commodities. But 
as you might have guessed, we've got a problem again, a problem when it comes to coins. So where does the value of the coin come from? Is it the amount of the precious metal in the coin? Is uh, if a coin weighs one gram of gold, is that what its value is? Whatever the value of one gram of gold is. Well, again, initially that was often the case, but coins can be very easily adulterated. They can be clipped, they can be shaved, take off little tiny bits, and if you keep doing that enough, you, you actually can steal quite a bit of money. So if you're trading in gold coins and the gold coins are supposed to be valued as, as, as much as they weigh, you shave off a little, especially if you have um, crude means for, for weighing them, if you don't have standardized measurements and, and um, properly calibrated uh, weights, things to, uh, uh, scales, then it's very easy to steal tiny amounts of money by clipping and shaving coins. And of course, the production. Again, we're talking about um, a society with technology not quite as advanced as ours, so the production process can vary. Not all coins necessarily would have the exact same amount of weight. And this is why, over time, eventually, the metal in coins came to be non-precious metals. Our, our coins now, they're not worth, the metal in them is worth less than the face value of the coins, usually. So the, va the coins, the value of them can't come from just the precious metal. That's too easy to, uh, to manipulate. So coins come to have a value not set by the amount that they weigh, not judged by the amount of the precious metal in them, but the value that's set by the issuing authority. The coin represents a certain value of the money commodity. It does not actually uh, present that value of the money commodity. So for example, 25 cents, a quarter, is worth 25 cents because it is said to be worth 25 cents. The amount of metal in that quarter is not worth 25 cents. It's worth much less than that. Now, in our times, again, coins, uh, and money, they're not actually made out of precious materials. So um, their value is just set by what's printed on it. But talking about the 16th century, when coins, when money was made out of the actual precious metal that, bear, that, that bears the value, you have a potential contradiction. There's the value of the material in the coin, the actual weight of the gold, and again, that can be adulterated, that can be manipulated, and the value represented by the coin, the value that the government says the coin is worth. This is a potential contradiction. These two things are not necessarily going to be the same because the government might say, this is worth X amount of gold, but if it doesn't weigh that much, if it weighs less than that, then you have this difference. You have this contradiction within money itself. So in Shakespeare's time, who is it that sets the value of the coin? Well, it's the monarch. It's the, it's the authority that ultimately derives from the monarch that establishes the value of the coin. And coins were closely associated with monarchical power. They were usually stamped with the royal image. In fact, in England, coins became one of the prime, uh, uh, one of the premier locations for royal portraits. And the names, especially in Shakespeare's times, we see that many of the names of coins were names related to royal royalty, crowns, nobles, sovereigns. These are all names given to money. And we can see even in modern time, we think about how money is associated with government authority. It's all about the Benjamins, right? Benjamin Franklin is on the $100 bill, so we associate the money with Benjamin Franklin, or dead presidents, as the, the saying goes. So the value of the money is closely associated with the monarch's power, or the authority of the issuing power. So when we think about it, in a sense, the value of any coin, or the value of any form of money, is a type of credit. That is, the coin has value because we believe it has value. We credit it with value. We believe in the authority of the issuing power. We credit the government with the power to issue us money, so we believe in the value of the money that they issue. 
So now to go back to the question of value again, when you're buying a commodity, how much is your money worth? Is your money worth the face value of the coin? That is the amount the king or queen says it's worth? Or is it worth what the merchant will give you for it? Is it what the merchant says? Well, this coin, even though the king says it's worth one pound, it actually weighs a little bit less than that. It's only got half a pound's worth of gold in it, so I'll only give you a half a pound for the coin, or I'll only value it at half pound. Which is it? Now, we th often think about Renaissance society, or earlier societies, particularly under monarchies, as very highly restrictive compared to modern democracy. Uh, but of course, we have to remember that the power of government was far more limited in a variety of ways because of uh, the virtue of less sophisticated technology to monitor, uh, less developed infrastructure, etc. So while the ruler could declare something to have a certain value, in the day-to-day -day reality of economic transactions, that value is going to shift according to how much a merchant, how much confidence a merchant has in the uh, uh, value of the coin itself. So really, when you ask the question, what is this coin worth? Or how much is this amount of money worth? You're also asking, what is the king worth? What is the monarch worth? What is the power that issued this money and that stands behind it? The power whose voice speaks through the money, how much are they worth? So I think you can, we can start to see how appropriate and how, how significant these questions are for a play like Henry IV part one and part two, which are plays about who is the rightful king? What makes someone a rightful king? Who is worthy to be king? So if the value of money or the value of a coin is in some way reliant on one's uh, faith in the issuing power, the issuing authority, then the value of that money will fluctuate as the stability, as the authority of that issuing power fluctuates. So if you are not confident in the government that issues you your money, or if that government is not stable, if that government is weak, then the money is weak. If you're not confident in them, you don't have confidence in the value of the money. The money just becomes meaningless paper or coins of, of value much less than what's stamped on their face. And if we think about England's long history of disruption and upheaval, a history that would have been very much in the minds of Shakespeare's audience, we can see how the connection between political instability and economic instability becomes an important question. Henry IV, who had usurped Richard II and then caused a, a, faced a number of rebellions within the country, that's the narrative that we're reading right now in Henry IV Part One. We also know of his grandson, Henry VI, and the War of the Roses, a long uh, civil strife that tore the country apart. Henry VIII and the Protestant Reformation, many uh, numerous moments of uh, numerous periods of instability, of upheaval, which suggests an instability and upheaval in economic value. The instability of one is tied closely to the instability of another. And in fact, Elizabeth I, who was monarch during Shakespeare's uh, time, one of her key goals in her economic policy was to realign the value of the coin, that is the value that the monarch said a coin was worth, with the value of the metal in the coin. This had been, uh, these, these values had been uh, disrupted. They'd been brought way out of alignment in previous uh, regimes previous under previous monarchs. The value of the metal was very different than the value of the coin, uh, and she wanted to bring these two things back together, and she did to a to large extent. Um, it was considered one of her great achievements to reform the coins. And But this is really about asserting the monarch's authority to set value and to standardize trade throughout the country. Again, this is largely about governmental authority as much as it is about economics and value itself. So kings and coins, the difference between a monarch's proclamation of value and a subject's recognition of value shows us that the value of money is at least in part illusory. The value of a dollar bill is 
because we believe it has it's worth a dollar it's what the subject believes or accepts in part money is always based on our faith in that money if you don't have any faith in it then you don't believe in it then, then it's worth nothing to you so by analogy and by the connection between them we see that the monarch's power is at least in part illusory the monarch speaks through the coins the monarch gives value to the currency but if the monarch is not powerful if the people do not accept the monarch or the government whatever the issuing authority is then the money is worthless and then in effect the monarch is worthless so a monarch's power is also at least in part illusory what the subject will recognize what the subject will accept we see in Henry the fourth part one a number of people who don't accept Henry's authority and thus they try to rebel against him they, they start the rebellions because they do not recognize him as authoritative they do not recognize his power as real they do not recognize him as worthy of the kingship so the monarch's power much like money is a form of credit is a type of credit we credit money with having a certain value we believe in the value of money and thus it has that value similarly is the monarch worthy is the monarch's authority credible how much do you believe in the monarch's authority just as your belief in money is required for the money to have value for you subjects must believe in a monarch's authority they must believe in the monarch's power in order for the monarch to truly be a monarch as we see in this play Henry the fourth part one there are many people who don't believe in Henry's authority they don't believe him to be worthy they do not credit him with the ability to be a king and thus they rebel against him they act out their beliefs which is to challenge the monarch's value challenge the monarch's power ultimately this leads us to a real paradoxical problem that is that the value of something a monarch a coin uh, a piece of land a TV a new car the value of that thing relies again at least in part and perhaps a very large part on how much you believe in that value a coin is worth 25 cents a bill is worth a hundred dollars because everyone believes the bill to be worth a hundred dollars in our current modern economy there is no gold standard there is no money commodity that is there used to be it used to be ostensibly theoretically you could go to the bank give them a hundred dollars and say give them a hundred dollar bill and say I want a hundred dollars in gold and get an amount of gold back that was only in theory very few places could you actually do that but now in today's modern economy there is no gold there is no commodity behind the money the only thing behind the money is the government's authority so really we believe that the money has value and thus it does if we were to as a society lose our faith in for example the US government completely uh, lose our, our belief in the government's validity or lose our faith in the the dollars uh, value it would have no value for us so the value of something is not always is not necessarily inherent value does not come from something inherently but it comes in from how much you believe in that value all right just as a review to end this uh, presentation we talked about the question of value where does value come from how does value how do, how do you know what to value something at we talked about how value is relative things are valued relative to one another and that's the first stage of the process of economic trade and as we looked into how the money emerges in order to facilitate trade to facilitate the exchange of commodities through the uh, through making valuation easy uh, we see that money has potentially contradictory value the value of the commodity itself how much money is a dollar bill worth how much uh, is the paper and ink in a dollar worth versus the value that the dollar is said to have the value that the dollar is given by the issuing authority these are two potentially very different values not so much uh, important in modern day but in a period like Shakespeare's 
where a coin was a, was actually made out of a certain amount of precious metal, that differentiation is very important. That difference, that distinction between the two values is crucial. And so we saw that money, in a sense, is a form of credit because money, the value of money relies on belief and just as much political authority relies on belief, relies on credit. How much will the subject credit the authority, credit their power, believe in their power? And so ultimately that led us to this paradox that the value of something comes largely from how much you believe in that value. If you think something is worth a lot, then it's worth a lot, at least to you. If a whole society thinks something is worth a lot, then it's worth a lot to that society. But if something, if you don't believe in the authority of the issuing power, you don't believe in the value of the coin or the dollar, then it's not valuable. So that's the paradox of value. So this is the end of part one. Next time I'll be looking more specifically at Henry IV part one, looking at some different sections in the play and talking about the economic language therein. If you have any questions, please uh, contact me and let me know. Otherwise, have a great day and week and weekend and year and life. And I hope to see you in the next video.